The Philippines is not without its own legends. Batangas province alone throbs with a thousand and one stories that have kept the curious alive with interest. One such legend persists within the Taal Lake and Taal Volcano area. For those who have always considered Taal a mere tourist attraction will be amazed at how much history lies beneath its waters and how much more of this history lies buried, waiting to be found. Taal Volcano, which is 60 kilometers south of Manila, has often been described as a beautiful woman, but one who is also ruthless and devastating. Having had recorded eruptions since 1572, it has proven to be utterly destructive, causing entire towns to be buried in its fiery wake. The volcano's exterior appearance is a portrait of serenity. In its breast, however, it harbors a continuing, seething anger, ready to give way when nature strikes the go signal. The enigmatic freshwater Taal Lake, which is around 200 meters deep, is a silent, scheming accomplice to the volcano's outbursts of temper. For centuries, it had only to lie and wait, ready to receive the remains of the havoc the volcano had wreaked. From its southwestern shore flows the picturesque Pansipit River, 20 kilometers from the South China Sea. One gentleman who was lured by the mystery of Taal Lake is Thomas Hargrove, a doctor of philosophy and a communications and publications executive at the International Rice Research Institute in Los Baños. Tom, I understand that you've done research and actual diving into Lake Taal on what you would call the sunken city. Could you tell us more about this? Well, it all began with a legend, Lauren. Uh, back in 1979, a fellow, his name is Erbito Anglio. He's the head of photography at the International Rice Research Institute, where I work. Told me a story over coffee that of a legend of a sunken town in church in Lake Taal. As an amateur diver with a multi-dive experience in Philippine seas, Hargrove's excitement over Onglio's story was unlike that which he had felt before. The prospects of making a dive into Lake Taal's murky depths were clearly a challenge to him. Armed with a legend, Hargrove and his party took up Taal's challenge. It was only the beginning of a search for historical truth, a search that has taken him so far to places beyond Philippine shores, to Mexico City, and to his own homeland, and into the distant past. One day in February of 1980, a group of us, um, we went to Beliti on the eastern shore, and there we hired two fishermen's bancas, and we went down south to this barrio. You can imagine this barrio is very remote and cannot even be reached by road, only by boat. And when these two bancas of both uh, uh, scuba divers, foreign and Filipino scuba divers, appeared one Sunday morning, it caused quite a bit of excitement. But when the people found out what we were there to, 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 to dive for, well, they became very helpful, they were very interested, uh, and they all told us where the sunken church was. But one person... Historical records allege that Lake Taal was settled in the 13th century by Moro immigrants from Brunei and Borneo. Pirates destroyed the first town of Taal near what is called Balangon, where Hargrove and his companions subsequently found the remains of an early settlement, including the remnants of an ancient cathedral that was constructed from coral rocks. The structure is hardly visible from a distance now, obscured as it is by dense growths. The 1570 landing of the Spaniards at Balayan Bay in what is now Batangas province saw Captain Juan de Salcedo being guided by Moros up a narrow arm of the sea into Lake Bongbon, the name by which Lake Taal was then known. The Spanish colonizers were said to have entered a town, but only after encountering a Moro ambuscade in which Salcedo was wounded. And then we found Spanish accounts that the lake was previously salt water. 
and that in starting in 1572 the town of Ta'al Augustinian priests came and established the town of Ta'al on the shore of a great lake of salt water surrounding a smoking volcano. Subsequent violent volcanic eruptions prompted the friars to use religion as an instrument for easing the anxiety of the natives. In 1611, it is said that 400 natives under the guidance of a priest erected a huge cross made of hardwood at the edge of the volcano's principal crater to exercise a deadly mountain. Ta'al's early prosperity as a trade center reached its climax when it became the capital of a newly established Ta'al province. Meanwhile, the missions of Tanawan and Sala on the lake's northern shore were built in 1584. In the 1600s, an Augustinian friar built a church and a convent named San Sebastian in an existing village named Tagbakin, which lay on Lake Ta'al's eastern shore. The patron's image was said to have disappeared and later found by a lipa tree to the north of Tagbakin. To this new site moved the entire settlement and it was renamed Lipa. Ta'al volcano often went on a rampage, spewing forth its fury with alarming regularity. When do you suppose um, had the eruption uh, occur that uh, submerged this city? Okay. There were, there were eruptions from the beginning. There were always eruptions. But the, the worst eruption of all was in 1754. It started in May and it ended in November. And it's well documented, actually. And at that time, the eruption, there was so much ash and smoke in the air that in Manila, they wrote that people had to carry lanterns in the middle of the day to see, all the way in Manila. And ash fell as far as Kalinga from the eruption. And during that eruption, the town of Ta'al was uh, bombarded, and finally the people abandoned the town in November, and they fled to Kasaisai, you know, the, uh, the beautiful little chapel of Kasaisai in what is today's Ta'al. They reestablished their town there and renamed it Ta'al. The Spanish priest uh, recorded how he went back to Ta'al and he found that the channel had been blocked to the sea. He dug in the church to try to find his, uh, his vestments and things like this. And then he wrote, he recorded, that the worst of all is that the mouth of the channel to the sea has been blocked and the lake waters are rising in flooding the towns of Lipa and Tanawan and inundating or covering their buildings. From a 1755 report on the 1754 eruption, a document retrieved by Hargrove from the National Archives in Mexico City, it was gathered that by 1755, the water had risen, likewise submerging Lipa, Tanawan and Sala. Residents of the towns had no recourse but to flee and relocate themselves in safer places. When the water receded, there was so much salt left that no one could drink or fish from the waters of the rivers. Tom Hargrove's first attempt to locate the purported sunken church turned out to be a horrible experience. Lake Taal's waters gave extremely low visibility and introduced him to the unfamiliar sea snakes. Well, I would never have gone back. We'd have never dived again, except for one thing. We didn't find the sunken church. But on that first dive, Ranjiv Kush, was the, he was then in high school and was the son of an eerie scientist, found at 60 feet depth a broken clay pot. And this is it. I don't know how he recognized it as a pot. And he brought it up, and then we took it to the uh, National Museum, the archaeological section. They kept it a couple of weeks and dated it as 15th or 16th century, pre-Spanish. And here you see we, we cleaned this off. But the most interesting part of it was this crust here. It's covered by coral. It's coral. I'm almost positive that it's coral. 
we've dipped, uh, dropped pieces into uh, hydrochloric acid and it bubbles, which means it's calcium carbonate, that it's organic. And, uh, okay, but how could this pot have been covered by coral? When Ta'al is supposed to be fresh water and corals thrive in seawater. Precisely. Either this pot had laid in the ocean for a long, long time and was covered with coral, then someone found it, took it to Lake Ta'al, dropped it in the water, and then we found it, which is not very likely, or the coral formed on it where it was. The first dive at Lumang Lipa, or Old Lipa, prodded Hargrove and his companions to reconstruct the area's history, causing him to raise more questions about it and enhancing his desire to dig deeper into what had, up to that point, just been legend to the town's folk. Did you ever wonder why the town of Ta'al is not on Lake Ta'al, but it's over on the ocean, right? Yeah. The answer is because it used to be on the southern shore of Lake Ta'al. The original Ta'al town is still there, where San Nicolas is today. But the towns of Lipa, Tanawan, and Sala were certainly not where they are presently. Based on chartings of the movement of the Ta'al towns, it appears that there may have been as many as 12 sites for them, four of which may now be lying at least 10 meters beneath the lake's waters. As bits and pieces slowly began falling into place, Tom returned again and again to the lake area to gather more data. What evidence has Tom have uh, you discovered in the process of your diving and your research that led to the creation of this uh, sunken city legend or is it a fact now? After we found this pot, then we started reading, then we went back to this barrio and their fishermen asked us to look at something else that's interesting. They call it Sapao, uh, S-A-P-A-O, which uh, they say means underwater, built up things under the water. And they took us to this place and we dived down and there we could see these walls that are built up of stacked stone at about uh, the bottoms at about 30 feet deep. And from there then, I started, we started doing more research uh, and I was at the National Archives one day in Manila and I was going through old Spanish documents um, this was about 1981 or 82 I guess and I always thought if I could just find a map and as I was leaving the archives I saw on the wall an old Spanish map and it turned out it was the Murillo Velarde map of 1734 which is generally considered the first fairly accurate map of the Philippines. And there was Lake Ta'al. And when I saw it though, it's connected by a wide channel to the sea, not by the Ponsapit River, which is uh, just a small river today, but by a wide channel. And there is the town of Ta'al on the southern shore, Lipa on the southeastern shore, and Tanawan along the northern shore. Sapau, which means built up structure underwater and which subsequently yielded new meanings of vital importance to Hargrove, were found to be parallel rows of wall-like formations one to two meters high and made of stones 20 to 25 centimeters in diameter. Although time and nature had obviously done their part in rendering the walls imperfect, they certainly appeared man-made. Along the lakeshore in Tangkaban, Hargrove and his party found heavily carved rock formations that rise one meter above water in the dry season, but are submerged during the rainy season. The Tangkaban Sapau were found to be of coral beneath its outer crust, leading Hargrove to conclude that they were ancient coral beds. Coral was used as building material for the original Ta'al Cathedral and for the church in Teisasai to which the fleeing Ta'alenos had sought refuge during the 1754 eruption. But no local legend exists that says there is a sunken church in Tangkaban. Instead, the legend places a church south of Lumang Lipa, where the Hargrove party found a coral-crusted pot on their first dive. A dive in late 1987 led to yet another discovery strange carvings on a rock 
close to the shore. On it were a dozen round holes, all perfectly carved. One could only surmise that these holes could have supported the base of a large light post, an immense cross, or a lookout tower or tanawan. Then, the party saw a wedge with a flat bottom, which turns to a 1.5 meter cul-de-sac to the north. Again, it could lead others to believe that it could have been an emplacement for a small cannon to guard Tanawan from ships invading the volcano island from the southwest. Or again, the base of a large cross the Augustinians may have erected to exercise the volcano. Furthermore, there is what the group had come to call the slot, also a perfectly chiseled structure, 70 centimeters long. They also found a semicircle of Sapau, a meter high, at a depth of three meters, facing Volcano Island six meters south of the rock. One myth says that the Sapau may have been ruins of pre-Spanish forts, which compounds the mystery of the Taal area. While Sapau could indeed be the remains of a sunken church, it could also be related to a cemetery found by a farmer within 100 meters of a small church in Balas. The graves yielded Chinese celadon and Filipino clay pots, indicating pre-Spanish burial practices that ceased when Catholicism was introduced in the Philippines. Hargrove's several dives into Lake Taal pushed him to do more and more research. It was perhaps a natural instinct as he is basically a scientist who also did not relish the thought of being branded a charlatan or considered gullible. Each research effort has so far been rewarding, especially with the surfacing of old maps, because they served as strong evidence that Lake Taal was once easily accessible from the sea. To him, however, it is the marine life in the lake that has strongly supported what could be mere historical or biological coincidences. Uh, the marine life is fascinating. You know, the lake abounds with marine life that shouldn't be there, but apparently has adapted since the days it was salt water. Uh, you're familiar with the famous uh, maliputo. Maliputo, yes. Yeah. Okay, that is actually a mackerel that is adapted to fresh water. The tawiris, uh, the famous uh, small fish, the delicious, that is one of the world's only freshwater sardines. And when we go diving, what we try to do is to buy a couple of kilos of those uh, tawilis and have them roasted while we're diving, and then we have that for lunch. Mm -hmm. Delicious. The uh, sharks were found in Lake Taal. There's Spanish records and documents, including by Dr. Rabor, the biologist at uh, the University of the Philippines at Los Banos, uh, confirms and has studied that there were sharks in the lake, but these sharks were exterminated by overfishing in the 1930s. But the most prevalent thing that you see are the sea snakes. They're very poisonous. They're the same sea snakes that are found that you see in the ocean off of the Phil uh, in Philippine waters. Uh, uh, there is, oh, as long as maybe two meters or six feet, no, maybe five feet long, uh, black and white banded with flat tails and little bitty small mouths. And uh, it's the world's only freshwater sea snake. Hargrove has had marine plants scientifically examined abroad and achieved results showing they belong to the sponge family, which is normally found only in seawater. Hargrove's most recent dive revealed more sponges and a deep sea coral reef. What is Thomas Hargrove up to? And what does he hope to achieve with his persistent investigative sorties to Lake Taal? His little network of research assistants, which include his wife and historical experts, foremost of whom is Dr. Isagani Medina of the UP, have consistently shared with him his drive to discover more conclusive evidence about what was originally a legend. I think it's confirmed. It's 
that uh, that these four towns were built along the lake and that Lipa and Tanawin uh, were abandoned and the priests wrote that they were uh, submerged. Mm -hmm. And we found walls then, these ruins and so forth, at the places on to where they're supposed to be. The only thing we're after here is history. To me, it's a fascinating story. It's a dramatic story. Uh, it's like detective work uh, or like working a jigsaw puzzle. The search never ends. And as more and more proofs emerge that point to the sunken settlement in Lake Ta'al, so does the entire picture slowly come into focus. Tom Hargrove is not out to disprove historical fact or dispel myths. He is only out to confirm what people have always believed exists.